Good evening, and welcome to the National Writers Series Virtual Author Event. We certainly miss our normal digs at the beautiful City Opera House in downtown Traverse City, Michigan, but are so glad you found us here virtually on Zoom. I'm Lisa Thavet and a proud member of the National Writers Series Board. I love this series because of the connection we all get to experience during these intimate conversations. As a Montessori educator and a comedic improviser, which by the way, I won't be doing any improv during this introduction, it's all about connection and deepening our understanding of our world and of each other. And that's what we're all in store for during this evening's conversation. I am so pleased to welcome Miles Harvey, who has written the story of James Strang, a man who in the 1800s crowned himself divine king of earth, heaven, and an island in Lake Michigan. His new book is titled, The King of Confidence, a tale of utopian dreamers, frontier schemers, true believers, false prophets, and the murder of an American prophet. It's a title as bold as the protagonist. Author Dave Eggers has praised this book as a ludicrously enjoyable, unputdownable read. Our guest host is Jeremiah Chamberlain, whom you'll hear more about in just a bit. Before we get started, I would like to encourage you to donate to the National Writers Series if you have the resources. We are a nonprofit and every donation, no matter its size, fosters our mission of holding great conversations with these incredible storytellers. In fact, our next event is on July 23rd with the thriller author, Brad Thor. Besides these events, we also are building the skills of young readers and writers in the Traverse City area. In fact, this event would not be possible without our sponsors and donors who generously keep us afloat. Here's a video thanking them created by our fellow board member, Ben Whiting, who is one of the key players in keeping this virtual event afloat creatively and technically. Go ahead, Ben, roll the film. Thanks so much, Ben. I'd now like to introduce our wonderful guests. Our host tonight is Jeremiah Chamberlain, a faculty member in the Department of English at the University of Michigan. He's a contributing editor for Poets and Writers Magazine and the editor-in-chief of Fiction Writers Review. His work has appeared in Absinthe, Fly Away, The Michigan Quarterly Review, Vagabond, and elsewhere. He's received fellowships from the Institute for Humanities at the University of Michigan, the Sozopol Fiction Seminars, and the Glen Arbor Arts Association. His teaching experiences have spanned the globe from Athens, Greece, a semester at sea, and as a writer in residence at the Interlaken Arts Academy. In 2017, he was a Fulbright Research Scholar in Bulgaria. Our guest author, Miles Harvey, is the recipient of a Knight Wallace Journalism Fellowship at the University of Michigan. His book, Painter in a Savage Land, was named a Chicago Tribune Best Book of the Year and a book list editor's choice. He teaches creative writing at DePaul University in Chicago, where he is a founding editor of Big Shoulders Books. He's also author of the national and international bestseller, The Island of Lost Maps. His newest book, 
The King of Confidence, went on sale in national bookstores today. We're so lucky to have him. Please be sure to order your copy at your favorite local booksellers website or in person if they're open. Local booksellers can really use your support right now. Miles and Jeremiah, we so look forward to this conversation about this legendary king of Beaver Island. Are we all set? Miles, can you hear me? Sure can, Jeremy. Welcome. Uh, it's so great to be back here to be a part of the National Writers Series again, uh, hosting my friend Miles Harvey, whose new book, The King of Confidence, we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Lisa and everyone else at the National Writers Series, their whole team, for bringing me back for this conversation. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, thing for me to be a part of this literary endeavor over the last, I guess it's almost 10 years now. Uh, and even though I'm at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, I always think of this as sort of a hometown series uh, since I grew up in the area. Uh, and so I want to thank everyone who's joined us tonight. Uh, I can't tell you how invaluable it is to have uh, your readership for these authors and uh, as well as your support for these bookstores. Uh, as Lisa said, uh, I hope you'll be able to get a copy of the book here at Horizon if you're uh, calling in locally or at your local bookstore if you're dialing in from somewhere else. Uh, you're doing so much to support these writers uh, and these stores beyond just uh, your readership. Uh, and I got to start with a little bit of salesmanship, right? Miles, this is a book about uh, uh, confidence men. So uh, let's begin there. Uh, but I swear, my friends, this is the genuine product, tried and true, guaranteed not to disappoint. It'll entertain, inform, delight, and amaze you. Try it. The King of Confidence, a tale of utopian dreamers, frontier schemers, true believers, false prophets, and the murder of an American monarch. How do I do? You will also cure rheumatism, Jeremy. I will. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to that as well. Well, joking aside, it's wonderful to be here and such an honor to talk to you about this book, um, especially with being the uh, inaugural event for your publication day. That's uh, wonderful. I've been such an admirer of yours for years. Uh, we've done panels together and I really couldn't think of a better fit uh, for this audience, uh, especially since so much of the story takes place right around the corner. Uh, on Beaver Island here. Uh, and even though we're doing this virtually, um, I told Miles, for those of you who are regulars, to imagine a beautiful late 19th century opera house. So we'll all envision ourselves there and hope we'll all be back there together soon, uh, which also seems quite fitting for this uh, discussion tonight. Um, so the last thing I'll say um, by means of housekeeping is again, welcome, thank you. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, later in the audience, we'll be doing some audience questions. Uh, so please go ahead and be thinking of those. And we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. You can chat your questions there at the bottom of the screen. So um, how about we start at the beginning, Miles? Uh, why don't you give us a little bit uh, about the uh, origin story for this book? Well, I think the first time I heard about James Strang, I was in Burlington, Wisconsin, which is a little town about two hours north of Chicago. Uh, my brother-in-law, Chris Carr, grew up there. Um, and we started driving around town one day, I don't know, 20 years ago, Jeremy. And Chris started pointing to old buildings and telling me about this story of a Mormon utopian colony that had existed in this little town in Wisconsin. And of course, this was the town um, Strang had occupied before moving to Beaver Island. Well, I didn't really think about <laughs> the story that much. I mean, I was really interested in it, but I, um, I don't know, about six years ago, I got, um, I guess, a call or an email from my agent saying an editor at Little Brown, big New York publishing house, wants to talk to you. And I was, of course, interested. And it was this um, guy, Ben George, who's been a wonderful collaborator. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I know your work and uh, I'm thinking um, that you might want to consider doing a book on Strang. And of course, I, you know, I was a little skeptical because I didn't come up with the idea, but um, I quickly realized not only that I really wanted to do this book, but that I sort of knew how I wanted to do it. And so things just went from there. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe before we go any further, we can uh, meet 
James Strang. Uh, maybe you'd be willing to read just a little bit from the beginning of the book to give us that uh, sense of this individual's character, and then we can... We that can sounds great. Talking. Ben, why don't you hit slide one while I'm reading, and we'll get a good look at him. Okay. So, although James Jesse Strang was physically unimposing, a few inches over five feet and bald, with an oddly bulging forehead, he did possess one distinguishing feature, his dark brown eyes, which one acquaintance described as rather small, but very bright and piercing, giving an extremely animated expression to his whole countenance. Another claimed that those eyes seemed, quote, as though they could bore right through a person. But more than any tangible attribute, Strang possessed an invisible, ineffable aura called confidence. And in those days, before electrical power, confidence was what made antebellum America hum. Confidence was black magic, good fortune, and hard cash combined. Confidence could turn worthless paper into glittering gold, cow towns into cities, empty lots into bustling businesses, losers into winners, paupers into millionaires. Confidence was a charm deployed by bankers and merchants, philosophers and politicians, clergymen and, uh, clergymen and card sharps alike. Confidence was the soul of trade in the words of a leading financial publication. Without it, added Herman Melville, commerce between man and man as between country and country would like to run down and stop. In an age before the federal government began printing paper money, an age when people had to trust in privately issued banknotes, glorified IOUs, confidence was the de facto national currency. Great. Let's talk a little bit more about that, Miles, that idea of, of confidence. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, and congratulations again on the Marvelous Review in the New York Times this morning. Um, I thought the, that reviewer got it right, um, concluding that review with thinking about the way in which this is on one hand a story of Strang, and I want to come back and talk about Strang more and, and all the particular events that took place nearby in, in Beaver Island and elsewhere, but it really is about this sort of moment in history, this this moment where the confidence man arose. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that concept or uh, what was sort of happening in the mid 1800s that gave rise to it and, and how Strang is in many ways a really a product of his, of his time. Yeah, I mean, this time period like ours was a time in which um, things, everyday reality, truth was very much in flux. It was a time of massive change, uh, social, economic, technological, uh, huge communications revolution. And people um, did not um, feel that they could hold on to the old things that they'd been holding on to. And so confidence in another person, hey, Jeremy, I, I feel confident that I can tell you this, <laughs> became really important. And um, so someone like Strang, who had this ability to attract confidence, um, was able to sort of bend the truth his way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit also about what else is sort of shaping this period at the time, because you have this moment of opportunity. You also have a moment of, you have a moment of idealism. You've got utopianists out there. I was really struck by the constellation of characters that you bring into this book. Uh, you bring in Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, who though I've read, you know, a number of, of Hawthorne's books over the years, I actually didn't realize or know anything about the many, many years he spent as a part of a utopian community. Um, you bring in all these m abolition movement um, people. So you've got Strang as this sort of gravitational force, but you've got all these other people orbiting um, sometimes crossing paths, sometimes not. Um, what else was in the air, so to speak, besides, besides this? Well, I mean, there was craziness in the air. There were all these, what we might now call, in some cases, religious cults. There was spiritualism, table wrapping, you know. Um, but there were also, and also all these exciting new religions, Mormonism among them. But there were, this was also the time when, you know, uh, the abolition movement really picks up steam and when mm -hmm. the women's movement gets started. It was just a really exciting time in American history. And, you know, I did see Strang as kind of this 
lightning rod for that whole period. I mean, he just had his sort of hands in so many of these things, including abolition. Um, and we can talk about that later, but he's just a really interesting um, three-dimensional figure. Mm -hmm. Well, let's maybe let's take a step back then, because I do want to talk about the sort of larger plot of the book and some of the goings on, um, especially with this audience, um, which has this sort of personal connection. In fact, uh, I, I dug up this old photograph and apologies to my father for for digging it out. Uh, but I, I came across this just a few moments before we started. I thought uh, I knew I had this out there. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a picture of me <laughs> on my first trip to Beaver Island. I want to say this is probably 1980. Four eighty-five. I'm the shorter one, by the way. Uh, and uh, coming back from that that first trip there, so a lot of people in the audience obviously have this personal connection to this place. And I'll also say that there are a number of books that have been written about um, Strang over the years, both fiction and nonfiction. So, how did you make this book your own? Um, how did you find the story that you wanted to really tell here from all that? I mean, you have almost 70 pages of notes and the bibliography in the back, which I found almost as fascinating as the book itself. But tell us about your story of Strang, Miles. Well, as you said, there have been several good books about Strang already. Um, there's three of them that I particularly admire. But, but um, I think m mostly those books sort of focused on Strang as a Mormon footnote to Mormon history or Strang as a, a Michigan story or a Midwestern story. One of those books is called Assassination of a Michigan King. I saw Strang as this, yeah, this lightning rod for all the fevers of the time. And um, it kind of just went from there. And I, and I, and I, you know, I think for your audience that knows this story, I mean, I think in some ways, Strang's like Johnny Appleseed or Paul Bunyan, right? Everybody in the Midwest has kind of maybe heard of him, but certainly in Michigan and Northern Michigan. Um, but I think I added some new um, research to his story, both good and bad. So um, good, uh, Strang was uh, an abolitionist. We knew that. I think I traced some of his roots as an abolitionist and his uh, encounter with firsthand encounter with slavery um, that really had a, a decisive effect on him. I say in the book, like Strang didn't believe in a lot of things firmly. He was both for and against polygamy. We could go on from there, but he consistently um, acted on behalf of the rights of African-Americans, both within the church, which was really progressive at that time, and as a legislator in Michigan. But I also found some, some new bad stuff about him. I mean, he has long been accused of running a pilot, pirate colony on island. And um, some people deny that that happened. There were tons of press reports about it at the time, but I pinned down more about that. For instance, there was a situation in Perrysburg, Ohio, where in real time in 1853, one of Strang's top lieutenants get, gets arrested for horse theft, which was a huge crime then. Strang comes to town, somebody gets bribed, there's a, a jailbreak, and um, Strang is there and people are writing about it at the time. So I think I, I added a little bit to the, to the picture of Strang and uh, he's just a fascinating figure to me. Mm -hmm. What were some of the most surprising things you came across? I mean you've had a little background, you were approached about this project, but what just really kind of sent you uh, across the room to say, oh, you've got to hear about this, or oh, oh this is an, what an amazing detail. Well, I mean, it, the story is just, um, I keep, when I tell people about it, I, I use the phrase, I am not making this up. <laughs> I mean, many of your um, listeners will know some of the basic stories. Strang started this uh, he, he was kind of a failure in Western New York as a lawyer, a newspaper editor, and a postmaster. Moved out to what was then the West, the wilds of Wisconsin, and sort of remade himself. And he'd been an atheist his whole life, um, but he went to Nauvoo, which was the big Mormon capital city at that time on the Mississippi, and converted to Mormonism. And then Joseph Smith was killed just months later, and suddenly Strang was claiming to be um, Smith's handpicked successor. Um, and eventually Strang just drew a big group of people around him and eventually they moved to Beaver Island. I mean, 
I was just um, surprised by his intelligence, his audacity, but also just his complexity. As I say, you know, this um, abolitionist side of him, I mean, he certainly wasn't the only abolitionist in the mid 1850s, but when he was in the Michigan legislature, he kind of voted against his own party. He was a Democrat. And even when the new Republican party came in, um, he voted with them and uh, fellow Democrats didn't like that um, to sort of uh, 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 nullify in Michigan, the Fugitive Slave Act, which of course was a very controversial law that um, made people release slaves in the North. Um, and so, um, I just found many aspects of him surprising. Mm -hmm. and maybe one of the ways we can help illustrate that too is I think you put together some slides, Miles, and we might have some of some of these central players that you can kind of walk us through or talk us to a little bit about. Yeah, why don't we show slide two? Uh, or uh, let's go to slide three, sorry. Okay, so this is one of Strang's first lieutenants. This is uh, John C. Bennett, uh, who is a, a, a real um, manipulator, and he had been kicked out of Nauvoo, but he'd been very influential in Nauvoo. He'd been in charge of the military in Nauvoo, the, the, the militia there, and he'd been the mayor, and uh, he, he um, was sort of a, a really noted um, polygamous, but he also, like so many people in this book, had such a, an interesting side. He was also a um, big advocate of the tomato. He helped popularize the tomato in the United States. Um, but eventually he and Strang had a falling out. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Okay, this guy is a really interesting guy. This was the, uh, another of Strang's top lieutenants. This is a, a really rare illustration that I tracked down. This guy's name is George J. Adams. And he was kind of a notorious guy in the country at that time. He was a um, preacher slash um, Shakespearean actor. And he would tour the country um, delivering uh, monologues from Richard III uh, on one day, as he's doing here, and um, uh, advocating on behalf of Strang the next day. And he was kind of an oaf. This picture um, got um, the journalist, the editor who was behind it, beat up. There's a famous incident which made worldwide head headlines, actually, um, where uh, Adams really hated this picture and, and uh, this editor had given Adams a bad review. So Adams stopped him on the streets of Boston and took out a horse whip and whipped the editor and then announced, I am George J. Adams and I will be preaching tomorrow and performing Richard III on the next day. So when this big crowd gathered. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, this is um, Strang's uh, nephew, Charles J. Douglas, um, who for many months traveled with Strang up and down the East Coast. Only his name was not Charles J. Douglas, and he was not a he, he was a she. This is Strang's first plural wife. In other words, his first polygamous wife. Um, uh, her name was Elvira Field, and Strang didn't want the original wife to know about um, about Elvira Field, and he was officially a big opponent of polygamy at the time. And so they traveled together. And one of the really interesting things about this period was, um, you know, what's amazing to me is not that they didn't fool everybody. Some people were on to Elvira Field, said, what is that woman doing in men's clothing? clothing and what does Strang think he's trying to pull off? But that they did fool a lot of other people. And so, uh, you know, gender relations in the mid 1850s are just a really interesting thing. I think also, is there a slide also of the bloomers? Do we have that one on here, uh, Miles? Yeah, that is um, that is slide uh, nine. Okay, this is a cartoon um, from the period. Um, uh, as you can see, it's it shows this sort of tough looking woman in what don't look like shocking clothes to us, but at the time were shocking. These, we call them bloomers now because the great um, uh, champion of women's rights, Amelia Bloomer began wearing them. And, um, uh, but a year before that on Strang's Island, Avira Field and other women were wearing them. And eventually bloomers uh, or pantaloons uh, more correctly 
became very controversial on the island. Um, Strang event, eventually ended up ordering all women that they must wear these pantaloons. And um, it's one of the things that led to his assassination. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Miles. Uh, I was just fascinated by the level of research you did in this book and uh, all of the stories that are sort of circulating around Strang, orbiting around Strang. Um, and I wonder, I mean, there must have been so many more you couldn't even include in here, right? I mean, how does one research not just an individual within a, a movement, within a particular place, within a community, but within a larger era of, of all these competing influences. How does one find a, a narrative in that too? Because one of the things I really admired about the book is that it reads in many ways like a novel. Um, there, are, there, are, there are plot twists, there's drama, there's great characterization. Uh, and it feels at times like, like I never would think to myself, oh, I'm reading a, a research or a nonfiction book. I really felt like this marvelous story you've created. Um, how, do you, how do you curate or find, find the, the, the pathway through so much work? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, Jeremy, you and I were on a panel together, I don't know, or so a year or so ago. One of the things I do um, is keep this massive timeline. So I think my timeline for this book, which is just this happened on this date, this happened on this date, this happened on this date, I think it was 250 plus pages, just the timeline. But what that timeline allows me to do is figure out what's happening both in Strang's life and in the world. And you make a lot of discoveries about both of them. You know, I also benefited um, from a revolution in um, a digital uh, newspaper libraries with 19th century newspapers over the past five years or 10 years. They've gotten really good. And I had access to information that other um, researchers, earlier researchers, as great as they were, simply didn't have access to. Mm. So that was really a helpful thing. And then, you know, I mean, I think I pride myself as a storyteller. I mean, I think mm -hmm. finding a way to um, introduce um, what's this complicated material that's happening all at once, sort of piece by piece, and think it through you know, chapter by chapter is something I really have with. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you a hard person to live with when you're in the middle of a book? Oh, man, you know, years ago, um, my wife pointed out that I'm always in a bad mood when I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's because I'm such a slow writer, you know, like, I think we think of brooding as something bad and writing as something good. But really, for me, they're like the same. So mm -hmm. when I'm like, spending 20 minutes on the same verb, you know, <laughs> And just these repeated thoughts in my head, these things that in any other context would be really bad, right? Like, oh, that sentence is running over and over in this terribly troubled person's mind. Well, yeah, <laughs> but that's yeah. just my life. And, I, you know, I wish <laughs> I were a, a faster writer, but it's just the way I am. So, yeah, I'm not, I don't know. You know, I, I, I think I, I, I have this little basement uh, office, which you can see behind me. And yeah. my family is kind enough to just kind of let me go down here and be an idiot. Uh -huh. Every once in a while, knock on the door to make sure you're all right. Yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> but you know, you're, you have, speaking of your wife, you have an interesting connection there too, right? Because she did the audio version of the book. Yeah, that was a real blast. You know, my wife, Rengan Altai, is a wonderful uh, Chicago actress and has done all sorts of work in stage and TV and, and screen and commercials. And she's done another audio book for Little Brown, Scott uh, Blackwood's a wonderful novel by Scott Blackwood. Um, but um, she did this book and, you know, we've never really collaborated before, but mm -hmm. I was just listening it to, to it today and I was like, you are good. So that was really fun to collaborate with her a little bit. Mostly she just went off and did her thing and said, leave me alone. I'm a professional, but it was really fun. That, to work with her. that was your collaboration? <laughs> kind of, but I mean, we talked, it was fun to sit around the dinner table and say, you know, what was your intention with this sentence in a way that uh -huh. you usually do? So. Oh, for inflection, like hearing the voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Let's take a step back. I mean, you mentioned technology earlier, both in the ability to access archives and things like that that you couldn't have before. But I was also really struck so many times reading this book, Miles, by the way in which it felt like it could be written about today in certain ways. Uh, the story feels so 
relevant in, in the contemporary moment. Uh, in the 1850s, you've got um, the telegraph is happening and you've got um, newspapers are allowed to send one copy to all other newspapers, sort of a uh, sort of an analog worldwide web, at least between publishers. Uh, so there's this enormous dissemination of news, which Strang used quite a bit to his um, to his benefit, right? Um, taking his own newspaper and then seeding these stories uh, about himself around around the world. But I also feel like we're in the midst of another uh, tech communication revolution that feels uh, like we're a little behind the curve, or at least maybe I just feel that way, um, that I wonder what sort of parallels you're seeing in terms of the way in which technology and communication technology specifically is being used today and some of the echoes that maybe felt almost a little strangely prescient. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think work. with... with um... Technology. One of the things I realized is that Strang was really, as you said, ahead of his time. He understood that we were that because he had been two things: a postmaster and an editor. He understood how, uh, and it's a little complicated to explain, but how news moved in the mid nineteenth century. And it was really not unlike uh, a sort of rudimentary, you know, uh, version of the information superhighway. And he realized brilliantly that he could not only create news from Beaver Island and get it out nationwide and sometimes world worldwide, but he could also um, control the news from this isolated place. And, you know, I'm struck in thinking about Kahneman. I, I just did a piece for the Wall Street Journal about other books about Kahneman. There was a guy named John Brinkley who, who um, he famously convinced thousands of American men to have um, goat gonads inserted into their bodies to restore their virility. But he was, the other part of him was he was a, a brilliant innovator in this new technology of radio. And I think now we have, you know, uh, a similar thing where, you know, uh, Russian troll farms can affect the U.S. election, or at least try to affect it. Mm. And so I think when truth is kind of slippery, um, people like this can really come in and have a big influence. Mm, that's terrific. Um, I want to, we've only got a few more minutes before we start moving over to the questions and it looks like there's some great ones there, but I, I want to get to just a couple of other things. Uh, we talked about the unique moment of this time. We talked about some of the unique technology happening in this time. Um, I was also really struck, you meditated in interesting ways on islands. Um, mm. And I'm wondering what you think about or whether you think this story would have or could have happened in the same way if it weren't in this sort of both isolated and connected sphere of the of Beaver Island? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there are two things to think about islands. Uh, you know, I wrote about islands in my first book, which is about maps, and I'm pretty fascinated by islands. I mean, I think in one way, there's just like the strategic advantage for Strang, right? I mean, when he w had this colony in... Um, uh, Wisconsin, you know, his enemies would come to town and stick around and his followers would get bored and leave. Well, Beaver Island was much better for that. And it was also much better for his criminal enterprises. But I also think islands just have this place in our imagination where mm -hmm. um, people can become new beings on island. And this, and this goes all the way from, you know, early mythology to Darwin, you know, um, and, and so there's, there's this idea that you can create yourself all over and that you can invent new rules. I mean, there's a reason that Thomas More's Utopia is on an island. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the Beaver Island was, and, and Beaver Island, those of you who've been there, there is a kind of magical way the light hangs over the island. And I, I just, it's a, it is kind of a magical place. And I could see people coming there for the first time as long as they were coming in summer, really digging the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned, I think, also seeing utopias side by side with um, places like this, which was obviously in Strang's uh, point of view, a utopic kind of project in, in certain ways, it seems. Miles, how do you navigate that? On the one hand, we often think of confidence men in this sort of cynical way. Um, and yet, um, do you also see him as this sort of idealistic character? Uh, I mean, how do you read between the lines through all your research of yeah, I mean, individual. I think both those aspects of him are there. One of the things we're lucky enough to have with Strang is his diaries from the time he's about, I don't know, 18 or 19 to 
23 maybe. Mm -hmm. And I think we see both sides of him in those. I mean, mm -hmm. I, he, he's really interested in utopian thought, but he mm -hmm. also is really cynical and he really realizes he can manipulate people. At one point he talks about how, I, hey, I, I'm, I'm an atheist secretly, but I'm really good about talking about religion and people get really jazzed up when they hear me talk about religion. So I think there, was, there were both those things for him. And as far as, you know, I, whether he believed his own, um, his own story, you know, I, I don't think we have an answer to that. I think it's quite possible. And I would probably say, I think the current president has this ability to, on the one hand, know you're lying. And on the other hand, thinking that lie is vital because you are a special chosen person. Mm. Um, and that you have a privilege to lie that other people don't have. And I think there was probably something like that with Strang. That's just my instinct. That's not based on, you know, uh, absolute evidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I want to turn to those questions in just a minute, but I have one, <laughs> one I'd love to hear you uh, address. I think you, we, we've talked about it already, but I think it'd be great for the audience. Uh, describe for me the perfect actor cast in this film for you. Oh, Nate Strang's um, uh, life yeah, into a my movie. my eighteen-year-old son Julian gets credit for this one. Uh, uh, could you put up that slide, Ben? It's um, eh, there. It is not bad, it, huh? It would be Jared Leto. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I was asked uh, by one newspaper to to come up with uh, a casting for Strang, and uh, you know, um, my son said. There's only one guy, but I, I mean, if you look at the two noses on these guys, those close set eyes and their sort of crazy charisma, I mean, I, I, I just think, man, you got to do that. But no one's asked me so far <laughs> yeah. about who, I, who should cast in my non-existent movie. Yeah. Well, on that note too, Miles, uh, did you ever consider making this into fiction or film? I mean, I know you're somebody who obviously narrative matters, story matters too, yeah. but did you ever consider the possibility of turning this into a novel since so much of it reads novelistically? I mean, I think there are some other interesting novels about Strang. I think that this is story is stranger than fiction. I think there's ways in which writing about Strang would be unbelievable as fiction. As far as a film goes, I mean, I got to say, um, Vanity Fair said it was something like ripe for a motion picture treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the only book I've ever written that I thought would would actually make a good movie. So if any of you are out there um, with a lot of production money. Um, feel free to be in touch. Yeah, feel free to be in touch. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Um, and I think uh, I've got plenty of other questions, but I, I wanna see what we've got from the audience. I can always draw a few more back out here. So um, we've started to address a couple of them that have come through, um, but I've got one here, um, and you sort of addressed this a little bit, um, that asks, uh, how do you see what's going on today in parallel with Strang's time, the flim flam man, et cetera? Uh, you, you've talked a little bit about it, but can you maybe talk a little bit more yeah, to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, obviously, um, scoundrels are not um, strictly an American invention. But, you know, like when Charles Dickens came to the United States in 1842, he was really struck by Americans' fascination with what he called smart men and smart dealing. These people who would lie in your face, rip you off, and everyone would say afterwards, well, uh, and, you know, he was a smart man. Right. Like that, that somehow the big lie was to be appreciated. Um, and I do think that's kind of an, a, an American thing. I think we're, we're kind of drawn to bigger than life figures. You know, P.T. Barnum, the great um, hoaxer showman comes out of the same period. And he and Strang have many things in common. But I, but I, and I think that in times of total change and flux, these people who can offer simple answers to complex problems and simple ways of seeing the world. And by telling people um, the magic words that we, that we want to hear um, that this is uh, that, that this is a time when these guys really survive, especially in American culture. Mm -hmm. That question, Miles, your response, Miles speaks to sort of uh, our reception of those folks, but there's another great question here um, about the other direction, the individual themselves. Uh, what do you think drives people like Strang? What motivates someone to seek such influence and power 
uh, nature or nurture? Are people born that way or genetics factor? You know, I, I'm, I'm not enough of an expert to say. I, but the, one of the interesting things about Strang is he wanted exactly what he got um, for a very long time. These journals are full of dreams of being a lawyer, statesman, emperor. You know, he talks about... Um, uh, it was in Princess Victoria, and he's serious. He says, if only I could kind of meet her, I'd marry her and become king of England, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some of that sounds really crazy, but he was a guy who had a really extraordinary ability to invent himself and to convince other people of that amazing invention. Do you think that is a, a kind of a thrill-seeking in a sense? Do you think it's uh, magical thinking? I mean, I guess I'm, I know you're not a psychologist or sociologist, but where does it, when you're reading his diaries, it had a, number, a couple of questions here from people about the diaries, um, which I'm sure you must have obviously studied very closely, trying to read between those lines of when someone is writing themselves toward the self, right? Or the old adage, uh, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, right? Like, how much of this do you think was uh, him sort of leaning into something that was already there? And is it, is it just something that gets out of hand? And once you've told the, the tale enough times, you have to kind of live it or you convince yourself of it? Well, I think telling the tale is the key phrase here. Okay. Um, Strang was a man who read books, loved books, was influenced by books. When he was a, you know, obscure farm boy in Western New York, you know, he was reading books um, and he was thinking about himself. I think he completely created himself out of words. Um, At one point, um, if you could put slide two on, Ben. Oh, maybe not. Oh, there we go. Strang, um, to try to convince people he was a prophet, he dug up some plates. And um, um, with this language unknown to anyone else, except for luckily, James Strang, through Revelation, was able, able to translate it and it pretty much said, James Strang is the prophet, right? But he also, Strang, was just brilliant. He wrote um, holy books. He was a really good newspaper writer. Um, He had talent. And so what's interesting is when, after he was murdered, his enemies came and raided the island. And one of the things that's really interesting that they did is they took great pleasure in destroying his printing press. And I just saw that as so symbolic that this man who had been completely created out of words was now sort of the coup de grace was destroying his press. I just thought that was kind of a nice poetic moment in his story. Yeah, it's a beautiful moment you write as well in Miles with them coming in and the the lead type being cast around almost like buckshot and the the sort of pleasure of the dismantling. It's It feels both like a a physical and that a spiritual dismantling of, of an individual who shockingly also, um, despite being shot several times, did not immediately pass away. And I immediately thought, oh my goodness, there's going to be myths of the, the resurrection of, of Strang here among the followers. And even later in the book, you talk about one of his wives. I'm not giving anything away, right? We know this happens in the beginning of the, in the, beginning of the book. Um, also still believing though, you know, um, the, the effect that this has on the people around those individuals who care for them and care about them and, and have invested their lives and invested their material resources and, and invested um, so much of their, their selves in this sort of hope uh, that someone else has carried to them. Well, I mean, many of his followers were people of great faith. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I don't question their faith. I mean, I, I, I think many of the people around him um, truly believe that they and he were going to welcome in the second coming on Beaver Island. And, that, you know, that's no small accomplishment. I mean, you know, I, I mean, especially in a time, I mean, this, this was a time period when there was all sorts of religious fever. I mean, um, this one guy, Miller, um, predicted the exact day that the world would end. And he had tens of thousands, if not more, followers around the United States. They all sold off their property and uh, waited for the end of the world. And then it didn't come. And Miller had to go back and recalculate and say, no, the world's ending on this day. And then it didn't come again on that day. And then people kind of gave up on him. But, uh, yeah. but it, you know, it was a really um, 
intense period in American history. Mm -hmm. So do you think that was genuine on his part? There's another question here about um, whether you find Strang to be a deliberate fraud and con man or, or whether he was motivated by more genuine, genuine intentions. Do you think by the end he believed his own own message and had kind of um, yeah. was moved from a man of not faith to a man of faith or because he changed obviously positions at times about things like polygamy. Um, was that an evolution or was that convenient? And was his faith also for you, you think? Uh, a convenient? Well, he definitely had a habit of having revelations from God whenever he needed a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. um, but, but as far as that goes, I mean, I think it may be kind of a false dichotomy to say, con man or prophet. I, okay. I think it's possible to be um, both and several degrees in between at the same time, which is one of the things I loved about him. You know, when you're um, writing about a character, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you want someone contradictory, you want someone three-dimensional. And this guy was just, he's such an amazing, interesting person. You know, among other things, he was kind of an early scientist. He got published in the Smithsonian annual publication. He and his uh, first plural wife, Elvira, were involved in what was like this amazing crowdsourcing effort to figure out how the weather works in the United States. And as a result of that effort, we mm -hmm. now, we, people learn that, that fronts move from west to east. And he was kind of like a deeply uh, engaged and interesting person. So I, I don't, I kind of think he was an American original is what I think uh -huh. about him. Are there, uh, here's another question. Are there any remnants or reminders of Strang's rule on Beaver Island today? Like what's, what's been left behind? So not much in terms of buildings, but in terms of place names, a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Starting with St. James, the, the town in Beaver Island is named after him. Um, those of you who've been to Beaver Island know that the one big um, roadway is called the King's Highway. There's a reason for that. Um, it's a highway that Strang had his people built. And now it's a big blacktop road or as big as they get in Beaver Island. Um, so place names are everywhere. But as far as buildings, uh, not much. And um, partly because the Mormons, after Strang was killed in 1856, were really run off the island um, mm. by his enemies. And it wasn't pretty. They were told to get on a boat and leave. And now uh, their property was seized from them, although... In fairness, they had seized it from, they were squatters basically on, on U.S. government property. So, but, uh, but no, he was a really fascinating uh, person in that way. And so, yeah. How about the legacy beyond the island? I mean, what's the, what is the legacy of, of James Jesse Strang as far as for you, for you? Oh, well, you know, I think in terms of um, his church, there's still Strangites and, I, and I've met one of them and been in communications with others, but I, I can't speak for them. Um, some of them are in Burlington, Wisconsin still. I know that. Um, and, and so that's interesting. I mean, I think what's interesting about him is what could have been, because what could have been is a, a powerful place in the Mormon church. It's really easy for us to say, oh, Brigham Young was triumphant, but as late as 1853, when Young was already established well in Utah, um, there was a lot of talk in Washington, and Strang headed off for Washington, that Strang would be named governor of Utah, and, and mm -hmm. Young would be stripped of his power. Now, that never happened, and uh, I don't even know if Strang made it to Washington, but one of um, uh, Brigham Young's top emissaries um, was writing him and saying, you know, you, you better be worried about this guy. There's talk he's going to be named governor. And that could have been a really different history. So hmm. um, I think Strang's interesting in, in what could have been as much as what is now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Here, here's an interesting question uh, that I'd love to hear your, your thought on. If you had to explain Strang to someone with only one detail about him, what detail would you share? <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, I would share that um, he uh, went to ornate lengths to invent himself. So that letter um, from Joseph to Smith to Strang, 
may have indeed been some kind of letter from Smith to Strang. I don't think it was that that Strang pulled out after Smith died and said, "Hey, look, there's this letter from Smith saying I'm in charge of the church, pretty much." So it's it seems like a forgery, according to modern experts, and I, I think it is too. But it was such a good forgery. He was so clever, this guy, and so. I don't know if I have a simple characterization for him, but he, he's not um, kind of a bumbling oaf of a con man. That would be George J. Adams, the guy I showed you who was the Shakespearean actor slash preacher. Um, Mark Twain later encountered him, and um, at least one scholar thinks, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense, that Adams was Twain's... Um, uh, real life model for the king in in Huckleberry Finn, hmm. uh, so this hmm. this bumbling kind of um, but charismatic con man who could talk people into but not a great intellect, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Since we Strang started talk, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Since we started talking a little bit, we just glancingly um, touched on sort of the Mormon parts of Strang here. There's a question about um, the relationship between Strang, his Mormon followers, and the Irish fishing and farming culture that occupied the island. This is a huge tension in the, in the book, naturally, um, and it's layered even even more um, when you think also about the uh, indigenous folk who are in this area as well. And if you could talk a little bit about those tensions and relationships and how that that took place, because that, of course, leads to the end in a sense, too, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things is in this really remote island, as we all know, there were um, three groups that were kind of victims of American culture. Um, the Mormons who'd been forced out of Nauvoo, but several other places who, I mean, anti-Mormon prejudice was a real thing then, and it was ugly. Um, then you have the Irish who are fleeing the potato famine and coming up here and just trying to survive. And then you have the Native Americans who it was their land and their traditional land, and it had just recently been taken from them in you know, a very questionable treaty. And so you have these three outsiders kind of forces forced into each other and they sort of slam off each other a lot and sort of the wild card in this was the Native American population up there which sort of sometimes mostly sided with the fishermen but sometimes with Strang Mm -hmm. but um, and Strang didn't make any friends by um, sending out ships to attack um, coastal towns and steal their stuff and so um, and again, he saw it as um, consecrating, um, uh, which means, you know, uh, uh, taking, well, they, they thought they were bringing in the second coming, so they didn't have time to worry about or, or energy to worry about details like, is this wrong to steal? And in fact, you know, one of the things that I was really loved in the Northern Ireland, Islander Strang's paper is he had a piece by Fred Douglas, which was, of course, Frederick Douglas. You guys just had an event on Douglas. Um, mm. And... It was a piece where Douglas, um, it's from one of his autobiographies, where he explains why it's okay to steal sometimes when you're an oppressed people. And I just thought, wow, this is really interesting. This brings Strang's interest in abolitionism and his need to self-justify what he's doing on that island. And were those relationships different? There's a number of different questions here as I'm sort of looking at this long feed about the predominantly Irish you mentioned, but also the Native Americans who are both on the island and also, if I remember correctly, maybe on nearby islands as well. Yeah. Are there different kind of relationships? And, um, you know, when Strang and his people show up, are they just taking the island over? I mean, is it also basically them squatting or? Yeah, it was pretty much, I mean, the, the the Mormons did buy some property on the, on the island, but, um, and the Native Americans mostly left and went to a nearby island um, pretty much when the Mormons got there. And, but most of the island was government land and Strang increasingly just took it over and, and stopped making any pretense. And increasingly uh, he and his people made life very difficult for uh, the other uh, European American settlers who were there. 
and force them off the island. Um, most notably, right before the first time Strang was elected to the state legislature, a lot of them were sort of asked to leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, well, there's a question about that actually, Miles. Maybe you could talk, keep talking in that direction about how to. It's one thing to sort of take take over an island and 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 bring people uh, to this community, but how does one then become a part of the Michigan legislature? Well, um, partly through manipulation and fraud. I mean, Strang's, the first time he got elected, he just, he didn't even announce his candidacy. Um, and he'd kind of used subterfuge to get elected by a small number of votes. The second time was more, um, let's put it this way, um, you know, there were people registered to vote on the island with names like Napoleon Bonaparte, who was one of Strang's <laughs> childhood heroes. Um, so, um, um, but the interesting thing about Strang is then when he went to Lansing, even the newspapers that had hated him and had demanded the U.S. raid the island and bring him to justice, even some of those newspapers were saying, you know, this guy is smart. This guy's a good legislature later. Man, uh, you know, he can give a great speech. So one of the many things that surprised me is how Strang could sort of adapt himself to a situation um, and uh, ingratiate himself. It was, it was just very quickly that he went from being, you know, the guy we can't ever let in these hallowed halls to, wow, what a good uh, colleague. Hmm. It also doesn't hurt if you get 100% of the vote right in your district. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But, but, but then, but, yeah, and, but then as I say, in his second term, Strang really stuck his neck out to vote, um, for um, anti-slavery issues. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so against his own party. And so that's a complex, interesting thing yeah. about this guy too. Yeah, and his, his, at one point, if my memory serves me correctly, interest in running for office in Utah, right? Against uh, Brigham Young, am I remembering this correctly? Uh, and there's a follow-up question here that maybe we can build off of that is, how do you think the Mormon religion would have been different had Strang not been assassinated. Do you think he would have I mean, made an impact in the larger sphere? It's hard for me to tell. Partly, I'm not a, a, a historian of the church, you know, and um, I read a lot about Brigham Young. I mean, I think Brigham Young was a, a fascinating figure too. I, I, there's a couple of biographies of him that I really enjoyed reading and got a lot out of. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know if Strang could have, um, maintain control and power in the way that Young did. I think Young was sort of um, a craftier guy in certain ways and um, less, um, you know, Strang in the end um, uh, kept trying to really assert power. And he said, you know, everyone in this island must wear these pantaloons, uh, all the women. And I think he, he brought his own demise in a certain way. And, and Brigham Young, you know, again, I don't know a ton about him, but he, he had a way of um, adjusting to the situation, I think, better than Strang did, at least l later on. Mm -hmm. I've time, only got time for one or two other questions, and I'll maybe ask you to answer sort of briefly on them. Um, but because you, you brought up this a moment ago, there have been a number of different questions I've been trying to get to about um, the relationships with... Um, uh, Strang and his wives, um, how they felt about him, their relationships, the complexity of that as you were doing your research were the things that surprised you or were illuminating for you about, about that. He started off so strongly against um, polygamy and then of course moves in, in the opposite direction quite firmly. Well, Strang's wives were fascinating people in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there's a writer named uh, Vicki Cleverly Speak who wrote a wonderful book on Strang that um, and it, focuses more on the women. And I learned a lot from that book and I cite the book in, in my book. Um, um, I think Strang's relationships with all of his wives were complex. Um, the one that really interested me in a certain way, well, there, I guess there were several of them that interested me, was his first wife, Mary, who um, was just a much more traditional kind of, um, you know, for lack of a better word, Victorian woman, you know, just sort of not a big free thinker. And she married this, you know, crazy improviser, charismatic, religious guy, but also just a, a guy who would shift on a dime. And she had a really, really uh, rough life. And I, I think the contrast between 
her and Elvira, the, the first plural wife, is really an interesting one because in many ways they were real opposites. You know, uh, Elvira was really able to occupy a space that women typically weren't able to occupy in that in, in, in mid-19th century culture in a lot of different ways. So I found that the sort of juxtaposition of those two women quite interesting, but the, but, um, the, the other ones are interesting too. It seems like there's some other books there for some people to be written uh, going off in those other directions, uh, exploring those other lives and writing those other narratives and those other perspectives that I think would be, would be marvelous to, to see, see come to fruition. Um, so Miles, as, as we move towards our conclusion here, we've got just a little less than, we've got about five minutes left. Um, we've got a question that's a little bit more general. How's it, how's it feel to finish such a huge project? Oh man, it, you know, it, it feels good, but um, you know, the thing about Strang was I really loved being in his, in his presence. You know, mm -hmm. I just, uh, he's such an interesting guy and um, I'll be sad to leave him. Um, <laughs> I, I spent, you know, the last five, six years um, going to sleep, thinking about Strang and waking up thinking about Strang and feeling that I was getting closer and closer to who he was in some ways, intuitively, but also in terms of research. Mm -hmm. um, and when I worked that hard on a book, and, and this guy was just so much fun to write about, and his times were so much fun to write about it. So I, I, I'll miss it. I, I hope to find someone as quirky and smart and contradictory and interesting as him. Mm -hmm. So you've now released James Jesse Strang and his story and this part of our history out into the world. Miles, congratulations. Um, a couple of people have asked if you've got uh, another project you're already itching to get towards, or will you give yourself a, a, a bit of a rest uh, to to let let Strang slowly slowly move away from your desk? Oh, I have a bad habit of taking a bit of a rest, Jeremy. <laughs> I think I should probably. Uh, uh, my agent has already given me at least one pep talk about like not taking a bit of a rest because my rests tend to last um, a little bit too long, especially for a, a man of upper middle age. <laughs> See, so we'll, we'll have, well, you're not going to give us away anything there. It sounds like, but no, I, but I'm you deserve a rest. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jeremy, there's something I want to talk to you yeah. about books. Yeah. Hey, look at this scorpion so, fish. Yeah. We, so, we said we would close out with a couple of pitches for books that we've both been. Yeah. When enjoying. I, when I do real book tours, I always like to take the, the books that interest me. Um, uh, and or that I'm reading and I just think I want to give a pep talk. I would love it if everyone out there in Zoom land would buy my book and I would love it if you would do it today because you can't go to the bookstore and browse. I'm sorry um, that well, I guess you start starting now you kind of can. So but I think authors really need your support and bookstores local bookstores really need your support. But I, I always like plugging fellow authors. So we had a couple of ones we wanted to talk about. Um, could you put um, number 12 on, Ben? Okay, these are, these are two books. Um, you know, Jeremy, I'm going to let you talk about Scorpion Fish because you've actually <laughs> read it, and I'm just about to start. Well, yeah, um, I'm, I'm a little bit biased because uh, I share a household with this uh, wonderful author, but I was thrilled to see that you shared the New York Times today uh, with uh, Natalie. Uh, I did? Her, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, you I were the book review and she was the new and notable. So yeah, we've got Scorpion Fish uh, by Natalie Bacopoulos, second novel, just out last week about contemporary Greece. An interesting time to be reading this book, in part which takes place on two adjoining balconies uh, between a young woman who's returned to Greece after her parents' unexpected passing to reclaim an apartment and uh, a sea captain uh, who they meet next door. Uh, it's a book about, about place and exploring the contemporary moment uh, and about art and grieving and friendship. Uh, we'll see if I did a good pitch there. And I would love to also give a little plug for Donovan Hones, a marvelous collection of essays that have been gathered in this book, The Inner Coast. And I'm sure you have a few words about this as well, Miles. Uh, Flat out uh, one of my favorite uh, nonfiction writers working in the country today. Yeah, uh, terrific. He wrote Moby Duck. He's, yep. uh, there, there's a, I always tell Donovan, there's a, one of the essays in here, they're all great, but one of the essays in here had a huge, uh, it kind of got me through a tough time when I was sort of given up on, not given up, but I just, it was, I read this essay and it just made me so jazzed about the possibilities of, of narrative 
Uh, yeah, Mar- Mar- Moby Dick's a favorite of mine as well. And these essays range from small little pieces about picking snails to essays on rust and tools uh, to uh, but all all around water uh, and place in really interesting ways. So and Ben, uh, just really yeah. quickly, if you could put on slide thirteen, I want to just plug another couple of books super quick. Okay, uh, the one on the the. Um, like Love is going to be out this fall. M- Michelle Morano is a, a colleague of mine, um, and there's several friends of mine who have exciting books. But this one is, is I think it's just so exciting. I know some of the essays from this book. She's one of the real fine essayists working today. And this- A favorite of mine on, as well. Yeah, and this takes on the taboo of um, unconsummated love between people. And I think it's one of the things we just don't talk about. And the other book is- an amazing book by a press I'm proud to say I helped found. It's Big Shoulders Book in Chicago. This book is free. It's getting a lot of publicity right now. Um, you can go to bigshouldersbooks.com, but it's by my wonderful colleague, Chris Green. Is yep. the editor of it. And this is- And let's say, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Miles, just oh, no. as we're, we're wrapping up here, um, Big Shoulders Press, but uh, I think we need to actually move real quick to thank everybody. Okay, uh, read American Gun. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. It's been a marvelous conversation. Please uh, visit uh, the website and give what you can. This is a marvelous series. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email with links. Read Miles's book. It's wonderful and amazing. Here it is one last time, The King of Confidence. Uh, wishing you well from Zoom land. And uh, thank you, Miles. It was terrific as always. I hope to thank see you, you Jeremy, soon. and uh, thank you to NWS, and thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Yeah, really great way to start my book off. Yeah, thrilled. Thank you so much, and thanks to the National Writers Series.